Distinguished Pullman limousines and convertible cabriolets with coachwork by the Glazer Company of Dresden on a wheelbase almost 3.8 meters long offered almost as much space as the average living room and above all, the unmistakable flair of the haute volée. Whereas in the Hoch, the place behind the steering wheel was usually reserved for the chauffeur, the mid-size wanderer was also driven by the man, or woman, who owned it. At the end of the 19th century, the Wanderer Company had made itself a name as a manufacturer of typewriters and bicycles. In 1913, it began to manufacture cars in Sigma near Chemnitz. It began with small cars. Appropriately enough, they were called dolls, in German Puppchen. In the 1920s, Wanderer set its sights on the mid-size car market. It offered two basic models with four-cylinder and six-cylinder engines. They were solid and fairly unobtrusive. Nevertheless, they not only took into consideration the buyer's desire for a car that expressed their social status, but also the demand for a car that they could really use. True to this concept, Wanderer was the first German company to manufacture station wagons, saloons and sedans that could be turned into delivery vehicles or ambulances. In 1930, General Manager Clay gave Ferdinand Porsche the job of developing new cars and equally new engines to power them. Already a very well-known engineer, Porsche created a six-cylinder engine made of light alloy with overhead valves and cylinder liners in direct contact with the cooling water. Until 1937, all Wanderer cars, and all Audi front-wheel drive cars too, incidentally, were powered by this Porsche engine. A technical treat in this respect was the Roadster introduced in 1936. Its Porsche motor was boosted to a continuous rating of 85 horsepower by means of a permanently driven supercharger. In terms of its styling too, this was one of the most attractive sports cars that could be bought back then. In the 1920s, those who wished to be mobile, or had to be for professional reasons, were dependent upon rail transport, which, as everyone knows, does not always serve the individual's needs. In the worst case, the travelling salesman had no choice but to stand and watch the train depart. Often, he not only missed his connection, but missed out on the next business deal, too. Those who were motorised could consider themselves lucky, even if it was only on two wheels, as with this young lady and her motorcycle. This salesman could consider himself even luckier to have met her right in front of the station. As expected, a comparative drive in parallel with the train yielded clear results. A motorcycle advertisement could hardly have been more convincing back in those days. In the idyllically located town of Chopau in the Erzgebirge Mountains, the cradle of these two-wheeled vehicles can be found. It was the Dane, Jürgen Skafter Rasmussen, who set up in business here. Starting with machine tools in the First World War years, when raw materials were scarce, he first tried his hand at steam-powered vehicles, unsuccessfully, under the name DKW, 
short for Dampfkraftwagen, the equivalent in German. He then turned to a much more promising drive system and sold a two-stroke scale model engine designed by Hugo Ruppe in 1919, now called Das Knabenwunsch, a boy's desire. In 1921, the engine's performance was increased and it became an auxiliary bicycle engine. This time, DKW came to stand for the small miracle in German. It goes up mountains like others come down, claimed the company's advertising, or it races around the Arvus in Berlin. From 1926 on, there was a separate racing department, and two years later, DKW advertisements were already able to claim over 1,000 racing victories. Rasmussen, the center of all the action, can be seen here with the industrialist Fritz von Opel and director Schmidt, a special guest at the edge of the track. The victorious triumvirate looks no less self-confident here. The role that the aerodynamically shaped tail fairing played in the victory remains unknown. This was the way to the top. In Germany, motorcycles, especially the ones from DKW, played a more central role in general motorization of the public than in other parts of the world. DKW motorcycles from Chopin were not only robust and powerful, but thanks to the fact that the two-stroke engine had only three moving parts, they could also be manufactured inexpensively and thus sold at an attractive price. Demand surpassed all expectations and led to a rationalization of the production processes and to the introduction of assembly line methods. In order to interest more potential buyers, DKW became a pioneer of the down payment business. From 1924 on, one could buy a DKW for 10 Reichsmark a week. This paid off. In 1928, DKW was the largest motorcycle factory in the world. Rasmussen wasn't satisfied with this. He launched this Framo three-wheeled delivery vehicle onto a hungry market of small business owners. Though it was little more than a motorcycle, it at least had one extra wheel. Apart from the DKW engine, this unconventional vehicle captivated its users with an additional characteristic. It was evidently bigger inside than it was outside. According to Rasmussen's business sense and logic, what was good for two- and three-wheeled vehicles would also be good for a genuine small car, which duly appeared in 1928 as the Type P15 with a motorcycle engine. After breaking into the car business, his next step didn't take long. He bought the Audi factories and had a totally new car designed there with front-wheel drive, a central pivot swing axle and a two-stroke engine. After only a six-week development period, the car was presented in January 1931 at the Automobile Show in Berlin and grew to become one of the most popular German small cars. A particularly remarkable feature is that the body, manufactured in Spandau, more than 200 kilometers north of Zwickau, was made of wood. This called for a good deal of well-planned logistics. The raw material delivered by ship on the river Havel could not be used immediately in production. It could not be processed further until pretreatment was complete, including five days storage and large drying ovens. The body plant looked more like a giant carpentry shop than the production halls with presses that were common elsewhere. The degree of efficiency the company's engineers achieved is still impressive today, as is the inventiveness that was the basis for the machines they developed themselves. Nevertheless, manual labor dominated the scene, which required excellently trained, highly skilled workers.
Covering the wood body with imitation leather was a job requiring seven people, and even 14 hands were not enough to accomplish all the tasks, so they put their mouths to work. In this way, on a good day, 300 bodies were produced. Loading was organized in the same way as production, semi-automated, fast-moving and, where it had to be, an uplifting experience. From time to time, DKW cars went off to adventurous lands. Under the hot African sun and with some local assistance, a safari was begun in order to remove any lingering doubts about the company's progressive technology. The two-stroke mixture was prepared with almost scientific accuracy. The convoy, including this attractive and rare coupe, then began its trip. Once in open country, the cars were able to prove, thanks to their robust wood construction and especially to the front-wheel drive, that no obstacle was too difficult to overcome. The cars were as tough and as sturdy as the buffaloes they encountered along the way.